Hello everyone. Welcome to yet another session of our NPTEL on nonlinear and adaptive control. I am Shrikant Sukumar from Systems and Control IIT Bombay. We are almost at the end of the 10th week of lectures on nonlinear and adaptive control. And uh, of late, we have been focusing on robustness in adaptive control. Um, it's uh, actually a property that is rather critical for um, you know real world implementation such as the SpaceX satellite orbiting the Earth that you see in my back. So uh, what we were looking at uh, last time was essentially uh, you know, projection based adaptive controllers as one way of implementing um, you know robustness. Yeah. So it was a rather nice way. It was sort of a direct attack on the issue of boundedness of parameters because when there was a disturbance, what we noticed was the bad thing that happens is that the parameters get disturbed. That is, the parameters start to become unbounded. Yeah. And we directly attacked this problem by using any prior information of uh, parameter bounds that we might have. And with this knowledge, we uh, used a projection operator using tan hyperbolic functions and show that we can actually design uh, you know, a control law and an update law and filtered variables which are bounded. So everything remains bounded in spite of uh, you know, disturbance. Disturbance does not change anything because of how we implement things. Yeah. So uh you know our, our results are not impacted by disturbance of course uh you know in the lyapunov stability analysis you still see that uh you know okay i apologize there seems to be okay there seems to be a very bit of sheets here yeah so you know the stability analysis is not impacted except for addition of some kind of uh you know disturbance terms in the v dots and these will essentially result in some kind of residual set behavior yeah on the year it doesn't matter to us because uh, this is the best expected outcome in case of disturbance anyway in standardly up on a uh, based nonlinear control yeah or any control for that matter because there's no way um, you can you know counter disturbance using smooth feedback of course you have sliding mode and you know other uh, you know sort of non smooth feedback which can actually do disturbance rejection also but that's not within the scope of what we are doing in this course yeah so it's a very nice uh, method right so very useful so in fact let me okay let me sort of get rid of this page because this is a repetition of this page yeah if you don't mind before we go forward Okay, just a second. Yeah, move to trash, trash. Excellent. So then what we uh, started doing pretty much at the end of the last session was uh, talking about the sigma modification. So we do know that there is a nice solution, which is essentially a projection solution in the presence of uh, knowledge of the bounds of the parameter A, right? But what happens if we do not have, you know, this kind of a knowledge, this kind of a prior information? Um, in those cases, we have to, you know, devise some kind of modifications of the adaptive law. So that's where we started. We started with the standard, very, very simple model we had, and we want to track some XM. And of course, we defined an E dot and a standard certainty equivalence control law. Um, with that, we had a standard adaptation law, which is well known with a Lyapunov candidate. Um, and what we propose, or what Ianu and Kokotovich proposed in the sigma modification adaptation law, is that you add a damping term. That is, the right hand side had no term in A hat. Right? So, this is what we also mentioned in the earlier projection method that non certainty equivalence based methods do not uh, you know, have a term 
in the uh, you know, estimate parameter estimate in the right hand side of the parameter estimate update log yeah and that's what we do here you add a term with the a hat on the right hand side which is a damping like term so it has a sigma term so that's why it's called the sigma modification because they chose the gain sigma here and gamma is of course retained here as it is right so this is the sigma modification so we want to start to look at it in more detail uh, today in this session so i'm going to mark our lecture 10.6 all right and now uh we of course add the disturbance right i mean we already had the disturbance in the dynamics right uh, and of course the design cannot account for any of this disturbance so obviously the design remains exactly the same as before the only difference being the sigma modification yeah so we again take the same lyapunov candidate yeah so no reason to choose another one and you get the derivative as e dot minus 1 over gamma a tilde i hat dot as always then i substitute for the closed loop dynamics yeah so i substitute this guy here and i get an e dot which is a tilde x and so this cancels minus ke from here and a disturbance from here right so this is what we get an e dot and then we have an a tilde a hat dot and a hat dot is just this so gamma e x times gamma sigma a hat and the gamma cancels out right so you're left with e x minus sigma times a hat all right great now you know we continue so you notice that this e x term cancels this that's essentially the purpose of the update law that the update law is chosen so that these two cancel out so it should not come to you as a big surprise so once these two cancel out you have the nice negative term in e again no, not a surprise then you have a term in e and d which is the disturbance term that we saw anyway in the beginning of this uh, week's lectures yeah and finally you have a term which is the new term which is sigma a hat a tilde this guy all right now uh, what we do is we write our uh, a hat in terms of the a tilde as a minus a tilde from here yeah so a minus a tilde just from this expression right here all right great and so what happens uh, you see that i start to get a minus sigma a tilde squared term okay so now i have two quadratic terms negative quadratics minus k squared minus sigma a tilde squared remember uh, when we started this discussion on this robustness i had mentioned that this issue of disturbance uh, causing some states to grow unbounded is primarily an outcome of the fact that we don't have strict lyapunov functions in adaptive control right even if we start with a strict lyapunov function for the known case when we start to do the adaptive control it becomes a non strict lyapunov function because the v dots always come out to be the same as the non adaptive case right but the v had an additional a tilde term right so therefore it became a non strict lyapunov function and that was the problem so this notice what this sigma modification has done it has introduced a negative term in the a tilde and this is what is somehow giving the strictification if you may yeah this is what is giving a strictification of course this is not for free because you already had the disturbance term which was okay let's not worry about it but you also end up with a sigma a tilde a term so you have an additional disturbance like term here right notice that both these terms are linear in the state so this is linear in e this is linear in a tilde right uh, a is a constant unknown but a constant sigma is a constant and d is not a constant but it's bounded by a constant all right great so now what do we do we use our standard uh, you know well i mean first of all we do a norm bounding right? which is like this is less than so i put norms everywhere or an absolute values everywhere because these are scalars if these were vectors i would put norms so this is just less than or equal to absolute value of e times absolute value of d which is less than or equal to uh, you know d max right so so this becomes the absolute value of e times d max 
and then I just put absolute value everywhere sigma times absolute value of a times absolute value of a tilde. All right, and now I simply do a standard you know, a b less than equal to a squared plus b squared by two on both of these terms. Right. Well, I don't do a standard. A, I actually do something slightly more. Right? Uh, so this guy is uh, actually uh, let me, this is written as less than equal to e squared by 2 plus d max squared by 2 so this term is the standard one but but this term i'm writing slightly differently as uh, this is written as sigma is multiplying here and by 2 and then i have epsilon a tilde squared plus 1 by epsilon a square yeah we already saw this kind of a decomposition also it's possible because i am simply writing uh, this as uh, equal to a uh, square root epsilon a tilde times a over square root epsilon yeah so this i can do this this is just a you know multiplication and division by square root of epsilon so nothing is changing so we've already done this kind of a decomposition so that's what we do for this term and now you just combine these with the square term right because i have a square term here so i have k minus one half e squared and then sigma minus uh, sigma minus sigma epsilon by 2 a tilde squared here and then i'm left with these square terms in uh, these unknowns right so these are unknown square constant uh, unknown constant positive constants here okay and then i of course combine this guy and this guy uh, and i get something like this and something like this okay it doesn't matter i could have combined it with one or the other and all that mess but but it is sort of irrelevant yeah you, you would essentially get similar outcomes similar sort of residual sets now what's happening here if you notice is that if you assume k is greater than half and epsilon is less than 2 of course that's important otherwise these quantities are not positive so this is you know just to you know sort of ensure that you have this quantity positive and this quantity positive that's all right uh, then we have v dot to be negative semi definite whenever this is positive and this is positive and that's given by these conditions when e is greater than this and also a tilde is greater than this now notice what happens right what happens here is we get two residual sets uh, two, uh, two residual sets meaning we get intersection of two residual sets right so if i was actually to draw a picture just like you know we did uh, you know for the standard case so if i was to make a picture like this let's try yes and this was say my uh no, e axis and this was a tilde axis yeah this is a rather you know, not perfectly done don't worry about it let's see I, i'm sort of drawing only a projection of this um yeah i'm only drawing a projection of this set so if i draw this guy uh, so there will be a residual set in e is like this and then there will be a residual set in a tilde which is like this so your trajectories so it can be very easily shown that your trajectories will in fact uh, lie here your system trajectories will in fact lie here okay so this red line of course represents your uh, a tilde which is you know uh, a over square root epsilon 2 minus epsilon and your uh, this magenta line which is the e bound is basically d max over square root 2 k minus 1 yeah so you can see that um, by choosing epsilon and k of course you can modulate these a little bit but the basic idea is there is a residual set in both so you are so you can see that um, you can never go unbounded here. 
where the ideas will never go unbounded. Why? Earlier you had uh, some V dot negative semi definite only in terms of the E, you know, E dynamics. Now what happened uh, in terms of the E variables? Now I have a residual set. I have sort of this V dot negative semi definite condition uh, for both. You know, it's an and condition. It is an and. It's not an or. It's not one or the other. So if even one of them, if A tilde, if the parameters try to escape this bound, right? If the parameters try to escape this bound, your V dot will still again become negative and pull them back, right? And similarly, if only E becomes, E starts to escape the bound, then also you will be pulled back by the negative V dot. So you move out in any direction, it doesn't matter. You will be pulled back out. So therefore, both E and A tilde will remain bounded. So you see and, there's an and condition in the residual set. So this is the rather nice feature of the sigma modification that, you know, first of all, it looks very simple compared to projection. Yeah. All of you have to agree. We all like simple things. Yeah. So all we did was, you know, really uh, just change the, add a damping term, you know, which would have sounded very, very logically obvious to all of you. Right. I mean, and hence, you know, when, uh, you know, Kokotevich came up within, with it in 1983, right? Really, really, really far back. So that was the logical conclusion. The absence of the damping term was doing some bad things, was essentially killing the robustness. So obviously, this is a very, very intuitive answer. Add a damping term. So in the presence of disturbance, you have very nice performance. In the sense, you have bounded performance. And, and if I increase my K, I can, of course, you know, reduce my residual set, right? Uh, epsilon is, of course, you know, uh, the point is epsilon is, of course, bounded. Right. So if you, it doesn't matter what you, you know, you cannot do too much with this bound is what I'm trying to say. You cannot do really too much with this bound. Okay. And we'll see why. Yeah. Um, and why we cannot do too much. I mean, one obvious reason why nothing much can be done is look at how the expression looks. And it is epsilon times two minus epsilon. And epsilon is, uh, the choice of epsilon is just between zero and two. Right. So whatever you do here. Uh, you know, the maximum value is, you know, rather bounded, right? I mean, it is lying, epsilon is between 0 and 2. So, if you choose epsilon to be very close to 2, then you have some really small quantity here. I mean, sorry, I mean, the way to make this small is to make this large, right? So, the largest this value can take is not much, honestly speaking. I mean, you, in fact, um, I I don't, uh, yeah, we have to see. It's It's essentially not difficult to compute what would be the largest value this guy can take so this is 2 epsilon minus epsilon squared so if i take partial with respect to epsilon this will be 2 minus 2 epsilon so at epsilon equal to 1 you have an optimum and what is that and this is so essentially the denominator is equal to 1 at epsilon equal to 1 right so that's what the denominator is exactly equal to 1 Right. Uh, now the question is, is this the maximum value? Yes, because if I take second derivative of this guy, so another derivative, it's nine, minus 2. It's negative 2. Therefore, this is in fact a maximum. So the largest value this can take is 1. Right. So, so the idea is that the residual set, yeah, so the, the minimum, uh, so it looks like from this, the residual set, the maximum or, or whatever, the, the least you can make this is A, which means your error will be less than A, okay, and not smaller than that, yeah. So, if your true value is A, you will be at uh, 2A or minus 2, uh, 2A or 0, okay, because your minimum error is A, A tilde is the error in the parameter estimate, remember, yeah. So, your parameter estimation error is A, which means if the true value is A, then you are either at 2A or 0, which is not saying much right so the residual set is large uh, on the other hand the uh, parameter residual can be made really small by choosing large control gain uh, that is still there but in any case we are getting bounded performance all the cool things so we should not be complaining too much i guess um, however one of the uh, two things first thing is even if the you know the disturbance is zero you still get only bounded performance. Why is that? Suppose I put d equal to 0 in ev in everything. Then what happens? This d max term is what goes away. This half goes away and the d max goes away. All of this goes away. Okay. So this is not there. This is not there. It doesn't matter if this is there or not. It's just some scaling. 
but this term goes away now if this term goes away what changes i still have some term here some residual term here yeah some disturbance like term here because of my introduction of the damping so my introduction of the damping creates a disturbance like term which is not going to go away even if you kill the external disturbance yeah so you can also think of a as some internal disturbance this damping as some internal disturbance that's what it behaves like right so this term is not going anywhere so all that will happen is that this will be not there this will be you know zero you now this term you know you can go to zero but you will still have a bound here yeah and if you have a bound uh, then you will still get boundedness yeah e will still not necessarily go to zero because you have some kind of a residual you know additional term here yeah because even if this term goes missing yeah you still have this guy yeah and you can see this is like a disturbance term and this is not going to allow v to go to zero even in the absence of disturbance so what happened the sigma modification did not need knowledge of the bounds on the parameter but of course it can't do everything it is always a give and take in life right this is the important lesson whenever you see a very technical presentation where there are no assumptions and everything can be done be very very skeptical yeah because there is no free lunch yeah so we did not require knowledge of parameter bounds and the construction was rather simple but uh, It, even in the absence of disturbance, it's only going to give bounded performance. If you're happy with that, great. If you're not, then you want to use projection. Yeah. The final thing is when e is really small. Um, when e becomes really small, you have poor tracking performance. Why? Okay. When e becomes really small, this guy goes to zero almost. Right. This guy goes to zero. So what happens? You just have this damping term. which is going to push the parameter value to zero because it's just exponential decay right so this is going to push the parameter value to zero right and it's i mean if you have learned the value of the parameter suppose you're getting very close to the true value of the parameter yeah and then suddenly your errors became zero in the system then you are essentially going to unlearn what you just learned yeah you learned the value of the parameter after some you know significant effort i hope but you're going to unlearn it yeah because of this kind of a problem okay. so in order to resolve the second issue the first issue cannot be resolved yeah doesn't matter uh if you will always get only bounded performance with these kind of modifications where you don't have any projection but for the second issue uh you can do some nice things right so if we, uh, and that is called a epsilon modification it came 4 years after the sigma modification by two other you know big names in adaptive control narendra and annaswami right and uh, what they do is <laughs> very simple again i mean very very intuitive and nice simple results very that's the best part of these instead of having just a sigma here yeah they put a term which is dependent on the parameter error okay and an absolute value okay so this is not exactly smooth yeah not exactly smooth so they put an absolute value here of error instead of the sigma that this is called the epsilon modification how does it change uh things as usual you have the same you know lyapunov candidate have the same cancellations okay and uh you are left with the same sort of terms here right the only difference is the only difference is instead of the sigma appearing in in these terms the absolute value of e appears here okay doesn't change anything because this is non negative yeah this is important absolute value is important okay because otherwise uh, you know you will have you could have negative quantities yeah? so, so just to ensure that these are non negative quantities this is important right so you have an absolute value of e here because sigma if you notice was a positive gain right so obviously if you want a damping term which is a negative term this has to be positive right can't have arbitrary sign quantities here to ensure that uh, of that it's at least not negative 
you have to put an absolute value here right otherwise this is not a damping term it can be a blowing up term also right so therefore the absolute value e is very essential here very critical so all that this does is it changes here okay instead of sigma you have an absolute value of e here and then you know rest of it is pretty much exactly the same yeah the and, and in fact the residual uh, set expressions also turn out to be exactly the same because nothing changes except for this sigma being replaced by this absolute value of e here right um, this has the same issue of course it is still only uniformly ultimately bounded if d is equal to zero why we call it uniform ultimate boundedness uh, it is uniformly bounded because it, initial conditions don't impact the bound right you you will still reach the same residual set you see there is no initial conditions appearing here that's why it's uniform why is it ultimate bound because it ultimately goes to this that is it it, it may start outside but it eventually goes into this set and yeah, that is asymptotically it goes into this set yeah not necessarily you know in one step or anything like that therefore it's uniform ultimate boundedness yeah if you look at large time it is uniformly bounded so this bound is not impacted by the initial condition but is valid after large time right so now what is the difference that happens here is in the adaptation law notice what happens uh, earlier the issue was that when e became small this term has no impact right and this term pushes a hat to zero and leads to unlearning okay now what did annaswami and narendra do they did the smart thing put a absolute value of e here and could not have put e here so they had to put an absolute value right um and what this does is when e gets close to zero both terms are equally small so there is no unlearning yeah if a had reached close to the true value of a then you continue to remain close to it because the right hand side of the the derivative is small because e is small so derivative is small so obviously you are not moving too far far away from the well learned value therefore your tracking performance is going to be better okay that's the whole idea of epsilon modification which is sort of a uh, one can say an improvement over the sigma modification remember although that you did put in a non smooth term in the update law yeah many again many um theoreticians and maybe even applied engineers may not like this this is a high frequency term in some sense right because if your e is oscillating between negative and positive values around the origin then this is you know this is uh, sort of giving you some trouble can potentially give you some trouble yeah because of the sign and yeah, this could become plus minus plus minus and all that yeah so remember that this may not always be the best option but well whatever i mean this is what is the epsilon modification yeah one can also smoothen this i guess if you want uh yeah but that's on you yeah that's that's also a possibility right a smoother version of this is also possible yeah you can again you stand hyperbolic or sigmoidal type functions all right excellent so what did we see today uh, we looked at an alternate way of doing robustness or imparting robustness to adaptive controllers via the sigma and epsilon modification the idea is that uh, the lapse or the flaw in the earlier design is the absence of a damping term so both sigma and epsilon modifications add a damping term to the update law adaptive update law right uh, while in sigma modification it's a constant sigma gain in the damping term in the epsilon modification it's a, the gain is actually absolute value of the error right the advantage of epsilon modification is that when the parameter has been learned and the error goes close to zero then you then the sigma modification will lead to unlearning of the parameter and a hat will become also zero because of the damping term but uh, in the epsilon modification because of the absolute value e scaling uh your parameter value uh, will not be unlearned in spite of the fact that your error grows close to zero okay and that's the advantage in both these cases there is a give and take because the bounds are not used uh, like in the projection case you get only bounded performance even if your disturbance is zero 
Okay, so there is of course, like I said, a give and take involved here. All right, excellent. So I hope you uh, found this week rather interesting and learned a little bit about robustness uh, in adaptive control. Uh, so I will see you in the upcoming week's sessions. Thank you. Thank you.